Welcome to this flight of the Retail Pilot. I'm your host, Ken Pilot, former CEO and current brand advisor, retail tech investor, and board member. I'm thrilled to share with you the insights from some of retail's leaders and legends, as well as my perspective on retail today. This podcast is sponsored by the following. Predict Spring is a global point of sale platform live in 22 countries. The platform includes mobile POS, endless aisle, fulfillment, inventory management, and client telling, creating a true omni experience for customers and associates. Predict Spring powers Suit Supply, Converse, Love Sack, Decium, Janie and Jack, and Beauclair. Breakfast helps brands like HelloFresh, Perfume.com, and QVC increase revenue across Meta and TikTok by creating hundreds of user-generated content video ads. The Breakfast Creator Network, with over 5,000 strong, produces original content that is authentic to each platform and built to drive performance, all done in as little as three weeks. Check out Breakfast.io. That's B-R-K-F-S-T dot I-O. Welcome to this week's KPOV for week ending November 11th. This week, I had a chance to have breakfast with Mark Mastronardi, the chief store officer at Macy's. Timing's great because, as you'll hear, today's guest is Terry Lundgren, the former CEO of Macy's. Mark and I had a chance to really get into what's happening in stores, specifically with Macy's, some of the challenges that he's facing, and also some of the technology he's employing. On the challenge side, no surprise, dealing with theft, major issue, especially with large retailers like Macy's, who have a number of doors where customers can come in and leave. But the biggest challenge is really organized crime, and that's what he is working feverishly to try and figure out solutions for, not only inside the store, but also working with local government. On the tech side, Macy's is doing a lot, and you'd be surprised because you think of Macy's as a legacy company, which they are, but they're probably doing more than most, if not all, in terms of what technology they're employing at the store level to improve the customer experience. Some things customers see, such as their walkie-talkie devices, which aren't, which aren't necessarily new. Some things customers don't see, such as RFID, which improves the quality of inventory in the stores. Anyway, it was a great meeting with Mark and uh, exciting times happening at Macy's as they move into their new small store strategy, which I get into with Terry Lundgren later on today's podcast. And now to the podcast with Terry Lundgren, which was pre-recorded. I am thrilled to have retail legend Terry Lundgren with me on today's Retail Pilot. Terry served for 14 years as a CEO of Macy's, retiring from Macy's in January 2018 after serving 10 months as the company's executive chair. Prior to becoming the CEO of the company in 2003 and chairman and CEO in January 2004, Lundgren had been president and chief merchandising officer since May of 1997. He is also the founder of the Terry Lundgren Center for Retail at the University of Arizona, where he hosts an annual conference for retail industry leaders and students interested in a career in retail and related industries. Lundgren currently serves on the boards of Procter & Gamble, New Data Network, and the Economic Club of New York. In addition, Terry also serves as an executive in residence at Columbia Business School. Terry has two daughters and resides in Florida with his wife, Tina. Terry, welcome to the show. Thanks, Ken. Happy to connect with you. It was great. We were able to connect on a webinar about a week or so ago and talk about a brand or a tech platform that we're both looking after carefully and helping manage uh, Drop It, which is a whole other conversation. But today, Terry, I want to talk a little bit about your journey through retail because it's an amazing career with some bold moves, I might add, as I've learned over the past. And then really focus on what's happening with retail today. Your perspective on the industry is not unlike any other year, a whole set of new challenges, but probably bigger ones for department stores. And we'll dive into that. So with 14 years at the helm of Macy's, working through the Federated Organization, how did you get there? What was your journey? (laughs) How much time do you have, Ken? (laughs) I really wasn't sure, like I think many 21-year-olds, 22-year-olds, what I wanted to do when I graduated college and, you know, went through the whole process, but ended up at the Bullock's department store in Los Angeles, which is now called 
with Macy's. But that's where I started. And I just, I joined because of the people, frankly, that I met, who I'm still in touch with today. And I was so impressed with the people. And I would, could look up and I could see some version of myself, perhaps 10, 15 years later. Maybe I could be like that person. Maybe I could have a career like this individual has had. And that really had an impact on me. So that's how I got there. And then, you know, worked hard and had the right opportunities and a lot of luck along the way. And 13 years later, I became president of the specialty store division called Bullock's Wilshire, which is so, sort of a today's Neiman Marcus X with Avenue level of product. And then that's how I got started. And I lost my job in a year because we got taken over. Ironically, by Macy's, Federated sold to Campo, Campo sold to Macy's, and, and I lost my job before they met me. And they put in their own players, which, you know, that's perfectly fine, but it wasn't fine for me. But I ended up going, I was very lucky, and I and Neiman Marcus picked me up, and I became the CEO of Neiman Marcus when I was 37. And I really enjoyed that career, and eventually went back to Federated, and then eventually became the head of Federated, and then changed the name to Macy's Inc. Alan Question was probably one of your mentors, maybe your greatest fan ever. How did he help guide your career? So when I said I was, you know, 22 years old and looking up and seeing individuals that maybe I could emulate one day, Alan Questrom was one of those individuals. And, you know, this has had such an impact on me because I said no to the HR department because they weren't paying enough. And I had a job offer paying more. And at that point in time, I was desperate to pay down the debt from my college and to buy something other than the beat up, you know, 64 Volkswagen bug that could barely make it from Tucson to you know, California, which is only an eight hour drive. So I desperately needed a car. And so money was my big attraction and Bullocks just wasn't paying. And then they said, wait a minute, you've got to come work here. And they took me upstairs, introduced me to Alan Questrom. And that changed everything. That changed everything to me. I ended up taking a job with Bullocks for less than I was being offered by uh, Xerox at that time was the highest bidder. And I took that job because I felt like they were paying attention to me and that I could perhaps see myself in a career long term with a company like that. So he had a big influence on me from the get go. And I had a feeling he would keep an eye on me if I you know, worked hard and performed. Now, if I'm not mistaken, did he offer you the job or did he tell you you were taking the job? I want to make there's some semantics that go along here with what actually happened. And I just want to be clear. Yeah, it's a good question. Because he actually sent me after we spent like 30 minutes together, he sent me down to a vice president named Mike Steinberg. And Mike Steinberg, you know, I don't think he was listening particularly well because I was trying to explain to him that I'm still in college. I have another like four or five months to, to go and exams. And he said, yeah, okay, you'll start Monday. And, and so we'll put you, you know, you'll be, you know I said, well, no, Mr. Uh, Mr. Steinberg. I, and, no, okay, fine. Okay, so Monday you'll start. And I go, whatever. Okay. I finally just said yes, so I could leave, but I was still in college. But this guy was another mentor to me, Mike Steinberg, and still in touch with both of these gentlemen. And then after the acquisition by Campo, that whole period, and you were out of a job, Alan Questrom circles back and brings you into another role? Yes. And I both lost our jobs. You know, his was more obvious because he was vice chairman of Federated Department Stores by this time. He was, at the time I met him, senior vice president. He he became CEO of Riches in Atlanta. Then they came back and was CEO of, of Bullock's Department Store. And then he became vice chairman of Federated Department Stores you know, with the acquisition, naturally lost his job to top management. I thought I had a shot, like, frankly, but didn't. And so he went to Neiman Marcus, and I was ready to take a job. I almost took a job with Duty Free, and I had an offer from Duty Free and Duty Free Shoppers. And he called and said, don't take that job. Don't take any job. Sit tight. You and I are going to Neiman Marcus together as a package deal. And that's what I did, and that's what happened. And we sort of went as a tag team. And he was the CEO. I was the number two guy. And just months later, Federated Department Stores went bankrupt, which was so sad for me because we were such a strong and healthy company, but they paid too much. Campo paid too much. And eventually you get to Macy's paid too much when they bought Bullocks and Bullocks Wilshire and iMagnet. And so when that happened, Ken, both of these companies ultimately went bankrupt. So they Federated went bankrupt first right away. They called Allen. And they said, please come back and be our CEO because we just swept the Campo organization out of the way and we need you to come back and save the company. 
And, you know, people were sad to see him go at Neiman Marcus. I was happy. I said, I love you, Alan, but now they're going to give me the shot. So I became the CEO uh, right away and had a great, great career there at Neiman Marcus. Macy's, I heard, listened to the things that you did there. I probably came away with the greatest respect around the fact that I think you can really be credited with creating Macy's as a national brand. And you did this through some major acquisitions, which I don't know how many people know about or think about, but I think there were two that were quite sizable, probably well ahead of their time, and took a, a great deal of cojones to probably <laughs> go to a board and talk to them about buying other people or just or other brands, other retailers, just like Macy's. Talk to us about those acquisitions, about what it was like, why you did it, and where Macy's was, and then went to following those acquisitions. Well, Ken, it starts with, oh, I was still at Neiman Marcus, and Macy's now had gone into bankruptcy. I was the CEO of Neiman Marcus and having a great time, and business was terrific. Life was good. And I get the call to go to Macy's as the you know, as a short-term interim, but eventually to be the CEO of, of the Macy's, the department store. At that point, what it was year, much- what year is this? What year is this, this is Terry? 1990, this is 1993. Okay. 1993. I said, I have no interest in doing that. First of all, I, I loved what I was doing and I didn't want to go to a bankrupt company. I was in a healthy organization and things were good. Their business was tough. Our business was good. I, you know, I'm thinking, what am I? What would I do that? Moving to New York, and, and I was living in Dallas, Texas, and so I call this same name again, Alan Questrom, who's the CEO of uh, Federated Department Stores. I said, Alan, listen, they came back when I said no with this offer that blew my socks off. I couldn't believe it. I mean, it's like staggering amounts of money for me. And he says, you've never taken a job for money, Terry. Why would you start now? And I said, you know, you make a point. <laughs> it's a good point. All right, you're right, you're right. You convinced me. So I call him back. I said, nope, in spite of the fact that this would change my life and my family's life, you know, everything about it. Nope, I'm not taking it. I said, no. I think they were surprised. And so they went after someone else shortly after that uh, when I said when I said no. And, and that person happened to work for Federated. And so this was a high-level uh, executive at Federated. And Alan Questrom called me and he said, you know, since you were thinking about going to Macy's, I said, no, I wasn't. I, he goes, no, you were thinking about it. Then you called me. He said, I think you should come to Federated instead and we'll buy Macy's. And I said, wow, now that sounds interesting. It took him six months to convince me, Ken, but he did. So I went in April of 94 and it was like November of 94, we bought, Federated bought Macy's. So six, seven months after I was there, we bought Macy's exactly as it was uh, envisioned. And it was very exciting. That was the first one. And then things go on. Alan Question moves on and, and I am become the CEO of, uh, I was first president and then, then CEO and then chairman and CEO and all this in, in 2003, 2004. And literally six months after I become the chairman CEO of, of uh, Federated Department Stores, I go to my board and say, Marshall Fields is for sale and we need to make a play for them because if we want to be a national department store, and I always believe that when Alan Question was talking to me about buying Macy's, I thought, well, we're going to make Macy's a national department store. This is back in 94. This is now we're 10 years later and we still haven't done it. And because nobody wanted to rock the boat because business was right. okay in Florida with Burdines and it was okay in Atlanta with Riches. And so why, why mess with that? And we were making money and and, and, I, and I just thought, well, there's a lot of new competitors coming around here at this point. We better do something about it because what's happening now, the status quo doesn't look that good to me. The future doesn't look that good. I can kind of see forward and I don't like it. So I'd, I'd like to take a risk and try something different. At this point, Macy's really is East Coast, West Coast. Yes. All the, and well, nothing Macy's in between. Calif California, New York, New Jersey, basically, and a couple of few stores in uh, Atlanta. That was it. There was less than 100 stores, 75, I think 75 stores all in, maybe yeah, yeah, six, maybe 60 stores all in. That was all it was. It was very regional. But the brand, Ken, the brand, I just thought, okay, who else? What store can say that millions of consumers spend Thanksgiving watching this brand all day long, you know, at the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? 
who else can say they have a fireworks show that's watched on July 4th with broad, broad appeal and appreciation? Again, millions of viewers. And we had, you know, the Easter flower show at Herald Square. I mean, it's all these iconic events. I said, who else? Miracle on 34th Street, movies about. So I said, there's only one. There's only one brand within our 13 or so uh, divisions that we have that could have this reach and appeal. And so that was sort of my vision. And so I, I got went to my board and they were like, whoa, what do you mean you want to bid for Marshall Fields? You just got here in this job. <laughs> Slow down. And so uh, long story short, they allowed me. I had a very disciplined approach uh, with my team, my finance team. And, and we had a very thoughtful approach about how we were going to go out, go about it. And long story short, we put our bid in and we got significantly outbid. It was a blind bid. We got significantly outbid by the May company. And I talked to my board that night and one of my board members said to me, I said, you know, guys, I said, we're going to walk, we're walking away from this deal. I told the bankers we're out because when I said, how big was their offer? And he said, it took my breath away. I said, that's all I have to hear because <laughs> so we're out. This is not a few pennies. This is a big, big spread. And so I said, I'm out. And I told my board, I said, I'm going to sleep well at night because we made the right decision and they paid too much. I said, I'm sure of it. I know we're outperforming May Company at this point. They can't afford to pay what they just paid. And they paid too much. And one of my board members says, Terry, he was the CEO of uh, Pepsi. I had two of them, CEO of Pepsi and uh, Craig Weatherup and Joe Neubauer, who was the CEO of Aramark and Steve Bolenbach invented the REIT. He, he was a former CEO of Hilton. I mean, the, I think really smart, capable people, Marlon Whittington, great group. And they said, sometimes these things have a tendency to come back around. So let's just wait and see what happens. One year later, Ken, the board of directors figured out May Company paid way too much for Marshall Fields. It was not adding any value. And they fired the CEO. Fired the CEO. The next day, I called the lead director. And I said, I'd like to have a meeting. I went to my board first and told them that I wanted to do this. And they said, go. And I think, Ken, I don't know that my board would have supported such a big acquisition a year later had I not had the discipline to turn down the bidding contest for the smaller Marshall Fields acquisition. So the board had, at this point, a lot of confidence. Again, we were performing well. We had turned things in the right direction, and we were disciplined financially. You were eyeballing the May Company, not just yes. Marshall Fields. And we ended up buying the May Company all in for $11 billion and with some debt. We sold off $8 billion of assets between duplicate stores in the malls, we sold Lord & Taylor, which is now called, uh, is owned by the, the Canadian firm that owns Saks Fifth Avenue. And they ended up closing that, but we got a billion two for that. Sold, I sold David's Bridal for $900 million. We had big, big sales and got rid of the debt. We basically got rid of the debt. We ended up, our net purchase price was less than what May Company paid for Marshall Field. So that was like the big, big win. I always say we got Marshall Fields as a gift with purchase when we bought the, the May company. So that was huge. And we closed that deal in 2005. And I waited. I did all the research because I, I, you know, I had a vision for this, as, as did some of my members of my team, not everybody, but some of my members of my team had a vision for a national fashion retailer. And I said, let's do the research and see if the consumers will actually shop at a store called Macy's in Chicago and a store called Macy's in in Portland, Oregon, and et cetera, around the country. And the research came back basically that said that they wouldn't find it. They might emotionally say that they're not going to shop, but history would suggest that they will, if the product's right and the value's right, that they'll shop with us. And we'd obviously have huge operational efficiencies with one brand instead of multiple brands. When this is said and done, actually, we'll, we'll fast forward to the end of your term at Macy's. Started with about 100 stores. When you left Macy's, how many stores were in, Macy's stores were in place? When I left Macy's, there were 600 stores in place, but on the way to 550, because we had identified, we'd already had closed some, we had identified another 50. Because at that point, Ken, our online business, Macy's.com and Bloomingdale's.com, we kept the Bloomingdale's brand as well was operating well above 20% of the total of total business. And so that was not all incremental. And that's what I think it was really important for us to all understand. The online business is not just incremental. In many cases, it was 
made possible by a physical store. Consumers went into the store, liked it, went home and bought the product, or they bought it online and picked up in the store. So it was made possible. But you know, it clearly wasn't all all incremental. And so we ended up having a plan to reduce the number of stores. So they're now about 550. But when I left, there were about 600, 600 stores and a big online business. So if I were to look at what you did over your career, I would say, and I could be wrong, and this will guarantee I don't get the next person as a guest, but this is a strategy <laughs> that probably Eddie Lampert looked to put in place when he bought Kmart, looking at the value of the assets, the real estate value, what he could sell, but ultimately may have worked out for him, but it really didn't work out for shareholders or the brand as that brand is gone today. Different business and definitely a different outcome. You mentioned e-commerce. I know that you had a, a big role in launching e-commerce and you did it early. Talk to us a little bit about when you actually said, we're going to be in this business too. Amazon was already out. There was rumblings about, quote unquote, the internet, whatever that meant. But you got Macy's in here, in there early. When did you decide that you were going to be in that business? When I started in uh, 1994, my division in California called Macy's West, and it was a separate division that ran California, basically, Arizona and Nevada. They were already fooling around with websites and the like early on. And when we were just going through, I was, you know, looking at everything. The first thing I did is I went out to all of our stores, our federated stores, and as many as I could and meet the management, meet the teams, do surprise visits, unannounced visits into stores, see what we looked like the customer would see it. I wanted to see it that way and did a lot of research. And in doing so, learned that we had a really talented team of people in San Francisco who were all over this subject, this location on the map called Silicon Valley. And they were the ones who were bringing this to my attention and to our attention. I was very impressed with what they were talking about. And I said, let's go. And I helped fund their expansion to turn it into not just a website, but an online business. It wasn't big and it wasn't profitable. So we had to just kind of stay with it. The hardest part, Ken, was uh, 2000 when everybody went under. Not everybody, obviously, but let's just say 90%, <laughs> it seems yeah. like of the online businesses went under. And we said, you know what, there's something here. And my belief was now having had five, six years under my belt of learning about it, customers like this and they will eventually want to shop this way. And just because we're not making money doesn't mean we should stop supporting this idea because that's what the customer wants. It's our problem. We have to figure out how to make money. But in the meantime, let's, let's take advantage of our early entry here and stay with it. And that was really critical because we kept investing through that early 2000s period and to, to build this very significant lead over almost all of our competitors. Running with e-commerce, building Macy's as a national brand. And then you also did some acquisitions while you were at Macy's. Blue Mercury comes to mind. What was behind that? Why did you do that? So Blue Mercury is an upscale beauty business they actually did not have much of an online business, but they had fantastic freestanding stores, about less than 100, like 90. But, but you know, I saw the, the market going in the beauty business, which we had to protect because we were a massive beauty business at both Macy's and Bloomingdale. Significant part of our business was in that beauty category. And so we wanted to make sure we protected that. And having freestanding stores was one way that we could be important to our suppliers. And I felt, always felt, you know, it has to be good for both of us. There has to be a win-win when I'm trying to convince our suppliers to do things with us, either exclusively or for the first time because they hadn't been with us before. I always felt they have to win as well as us. So I was thinking, if I can expand to a freestanding specialty store business, and in this case, they were not in the mall, they were in sort of the main street, high-end locations, and there was plenty more around the country to open, I thought that would be a chance for us to make Estee Lauder love us even more, the Estee Lauder Corporation, L'Oreal Corporation to love us even more, and all of our partners there, because we could give them more growth. And I also thought that there were certain high-end businesses that they were not selling us, you know, super high-end brands, the Bobby Browns, La Mer, Beauty, and they even Mac in some cases. They weren't selling us because they wanted to limit the distribution, but they certainly wanted to sell the Blue Mercury. 
And so I said, well, what if I put Blue Mercury inside of my some of my Macy's stores? And then will you still sell us? And they did. <laughs> I couldn't believe they did, but they did. And so it makes sense to me, but I got the brands that I wanted in those stores and it worked out great. And so once we got them in there and we proved that we could sell them very well and they had the cover of a Blue Mercury environment inside the Macy's store right next to the regular beauty department, everybody won. Maybe our competitors didn't win, but that would be the only thing. But we won and the brands won, uh, Blue Mercury won, and it was a, it was very successful. I was very proud of that business. We more than doubled the, they probably tripled the business by now. It's, it's just a very successful, profitable business. It's a great, great move. Let's look at today. Number of challenges, headwinds facing business, macro, microeconomic, all of the above. What do you see as the top three challenges facing retailers today? Well, I think there's, in, certainly in the United States, I think there's, uh, I've said this for a long time now, there's just too much physical space devoted to retail. And, you know, as I alluded to earlier with our own situation, it's certainly true nationally, today it's about 15% of the business is being done online. And, you know, one could argue when the business has been growing at 3 or 4%, 3% more likely, that you can't have suddenly 15% of the business being done online without reducing 10 or 12% of the, the physical stores. Now, we did some of that during COVID, but I still believe we have a way to go on that. So that's number one, because if there's too much retail, can what happens is these stores, they're too big. You can't afford to staff them. You can't afford to put capital into them. The value equation is just not there for the investment piece. And when you look at it that way, the store starts to deteriorate and the customer experience starts to deteriorate. When that happens, it's bad for your brand. And so I closed several stores that made money, that were cash flow positive, but I didn't like the way the consumer experience was happening inside those stores. And I couldn't invest it. The math suggested just because I own the real estate doesn't mean that I should keep it open because I'm making money. I didn't like the experience and the negative impact it was having on the brand. So I think that has to play itself out. That's first and foremost. I think the consumer has been spending like crazy in the last few years. That movie's going to come to an end. It just has to. And I think that period is coming. It's closer than perhaps we think because we've depended greatly on the middle household income and the lower household income who spend a huge amount and drive GDP in, in the United States. They've depended on the stimulus packages that are now winding down in terms of wanting. They're, of course, not being generated by Washington anymore, but they're now no longer a surplus in the savings accounts. They've spent that. And so that's the next leg, I think, is about to hit here, wherein the consumer stops spending and just spends on essentials. And then that middle household income consumer starts trading down, Ken. That's when I think our economy slows down. That's when I think we start losing jobs. And I think there's a ripple effect that will last for some period of time. So I think that's the, the second big one. And then, you know, department stores are kind of squarely in the middle there of the average household income consumer, their target. And what I worry about for department stores is getting squeezed again, because the high end, you know, the, the LVMHs of the world, the Gucci group, those guys have run a great business and have for a long time. And they really manage their supply and demand very effectively for a long, long time. And I think as when China eventually comes back, they'll have that as a potential lift to their business. And in the meantime, I think they'll be okay. And then there's a, the lower end of the spectrum. And I think as I referred to a minute ago, many of the middle-class consumers will trade down during an environment that I just described, you know, and of shrinking savings accounts and higher credit card debt, which we're also now beginning to see. And so when all that happens, I think consumers will trade down. And so I think the department store gets stuck here. And the only way out, and I've encouraged the new CEO of Macy's, who just is beginning his term in the last few months and will become full-time chairman and CEO in a few months, that he needs to give me a reason, give consumers a reason why shop at Macy's and not somewhere else. And that's got to be differentiated product. That's the number one thing. Consumers want to know I'm coming to you because you're offering me something different, both in the product and the shopping experience. So to that end, and it kind of addresses your earlier call out about 
the U.S. being either overstored or too many square feet per shopper. Macy's is now firmly going after a smaller store concept. They have, I believe there are 12 stores out there today that are about 30 to 40,000 square feet, maybe a fifth of the size of the average. And they just recently announced that they're going to open up another 30 through the end of 2024. What do you think about that strategy? I think it's a good strategy because I think there are markets where we had to vacate the entire market because we had a 200,000 square foot store or 180,000 square foot store and the volume had deteriorated significantly and it could no, we could no longer staff you know, three floors in a physical store. So I think the idea of coming back with a right-sized physical building that allows consumers to take advantage of the technology that's out there today and to buy online and pick it up in the store and to have stores you know, under, use technology to know what is the right inventory that I should have in Memphis, Tennessee, and have enough of that inventory, color, size, product category, in brands in Memphis, Tennessee. So when the consumer does buy online from a Memphis zip code, we can deliver it from there as opposed to shipping it from a warehouse in New Jersey. I do think that there's an opportunity for this small store format. And I think it'll serve multiple purposes for in-store shopping, as well as delivery to uh, online shoppers. It's interesting also, the real estate strategy is outside of the mall, which has typically been home to Macy's. But you got a great guy that's running that part of the business, Mark Mastronardi. I've been impressed with what he's done so far, and he seems to be heads down and focused on delivering this better small store experience to the customer. He's on it. Mark's was always one of my favorite key guys in the business while I was there. And uh, he's, a, he's a broad thinker, very creative. And I think Tony Spring, who's uh, the, the new CEO, was the CEO of Bloomingdale's before taking on the Macy's Inc. role. I think they're going to really gel together and, and come up with some great strategies like this one to maximize the inventory and maximize the potential for business on a local basis. Let's take a quick break with a word from our sponsors. BlueCore's software solution turns anonymous online shoppers into known customers and repeat customers. BlueCore enables retailers to personalize and optimize their email, SMS, and site marketing campaigns by delivering targeted and relevant messages based on where every customer is in their journey. BlueCore replaces annoying high volume messaging with high value messaging. Customers include Aloe Yoga, Neiman Marcus, and Gap. So we've seen a few other department stores go smaller. You've got Nordstrom with a Nordstrom Local. That's been something that they've been doing for a while. On the flip side, department stores have also turned to their own form of liquidation, whether it's backstage at Macy's or Nordstrom Rack. How does that play into the future for department stores in terms of using their space and maybe garnering a different customer? Yeah, I think it's more of the latter. We found a lot of crossover at Macy's with the off-price channel. So certainly we competed with lots of online retailers, but frankly, we always thought that the bigger loss of business was going to the off-price retailer. And so that's when we said, we better get into this game ourselves because consumers like to start there and they like to, they like this treasure hunt and, they, and, and kind of feel like they're getting a super deal, you know, in this off-price channel. And we wanted to participate in that. And I think it's worked. So I, the question is how big and can you do it in a way that doesn't, you know, deteriorate the main, you know, core business. And it was actually Jeff Gannett's idea while I was there to put the Macy's backstage off-price business inside of some of the less productive Macy's stores. So just go to the third floor and make the whole floor the off-price channel, and I was skeptical that we were going to lose business. We did lose some business in the first two floors in the core of Macy's categories, but incrementally, the store did better. So I think he was right about that because we were attracting a, a new customer, and then they were buying beauty from us, or they were buying you know accessories from us. And so that, I think, was a strategy that made sense to me, how to utilize your stores that are less productive today by adding 
an off-price element inside of it. So I think there's a need there, Ken. The question is, is how much, how many, you know, how far do you go there until you start to, you know, you know negatively impact the brand? The key is, can impact the brand. You still have to have that aspirational consumer coming up from the TJ Maxx and the off-price channel wanting to shop at Macy's. And we see that a lot through all of our consumer data. Like sometimes people will shop for themselves in the off-price channel, but if they want to give a gift and impress their boss or impress somebody else, you know, at a wedding, they give it in a Macy's box. To me, we have to have to make sure we never lose that, never lose that aspirational aspect of the consumer demand. You look out over the next 36 months to five years, what happens in the department store space? What kind of consolidation do you see happening and who will be some of the winners and who might be some of the losers? Yeah. So it's funny to me because I've had people say to me, do you think the department store will be around? They've said this to me, you know, 10 years ago, do you think this department store will be around in 10 years? And yep, I do. And I still believe it'll be around in the future. In fact, going back to Alan Questrom again, he said to me a long time ago, he said, you know, if there was not a department store today, if that was not part of the, the mix in retail, someone would invent the department store. Because the idea of bringing all the brands together in a convenient location, you know, using your credit card to buy all at once instead of going into the individual stores, he said, still makes a great deal of sense. And when you throw in the online, buy online, you know, the omni-channel consumer into that mix. Yeah, I think department stores are going to be around, but they're going to have to do a better job of servicing that customer, as I said, and they can't have the same product. So they've got to have reasons to go to Nordstrom versus Macy's versus Bloomingdale's and versus, you know, Kohl's and, and others. There has to be a differentiated reason. I don't think there's been enough focus on that over the last few years in my eyes. And so that's why I think that many are struggling now, but I strongly believe that the, the best merchants will figure this out. Best merchants will figure out what it is that the consumers expect of me, that I can deliver, that I can present, that will be different than all those other competitors. And I think when that happens again, I mean, this was really, really important to me during my era. You know, I begged, borrowed, and steal and promised everything. And, and I didn't lie about it, but I, there were certain things I promised that I wasn't sure how I was going to be able to do it. But we were able to get Tommy Hilfiger exclusive and that was a very big, big deal for us because once we did that, other smaller brands would follow because I said, I'm going to make this a massively important brand for our company. And I'm going to make sure that when we do that, we're going to do more business than Tommy did with his 25 locations or 25 companies that he sold to or 30, whatever he had at our one company. We're going to do more. And that was my commitment. And we did that eventually. We did that. And because we worked at it, you know, and, but, but you got to do that. If you believe that that Tommy Hilfiger customer will come into your store and then buy the Estee Lauder or buy the Michael Kors handbag, you win, you know? And so I passionately believe that. Same thing about the private label. We changed the name from private label to private brands because we wanted to make the ink brand, which was when I left, it was the number one volume of women's apparel brand. It was a billion dollar brand. And it was great. You know, we had women wearing the clothes in the department. The shops were as good as, as Ralph Lauren's shop or, or Michael Kors shop. We made it a priority. We made it a brand. And marketing was fantastic. And so I'm getting a little carried away here, Ken, but you, you can tell my passion here that you have to have uniqueness in your assortment and in your experience inside the store if consumers are going to continue to shop in a department store. And I really feel strongly about that. So along the lines of differentiation, you mentioned Tommy Hilfiger, which I think is a great example around creating exclusivity and a reason for the customer to come shop at Macy's. Can you take a look at other retailers like Nordstrom, who may be focused a bit more on D2C brands, carrying some of the smaller, newer brands? I think one way for department stores to continue to thrive is how they leverage or use their real estate, maybe how they offload their real estate, going back to a model that's been around forever, which is the lease department. But I, I think it's probably a way that helps save money and also add a bit more energy because I think brands can do a better job of managing their brand within a department store than potentially the, the department store can do managing the brand for them. 
are we going to start to see more of that, more shop-in shops? I know Kohl's has done a fair amount of that. Target has done some of that. Is that an opportunity that you see for department stores? I do. You just said the right words, Ken. If they can do it better than you, then they should do it for you. You know, if you think you're taking an easy way out and just going to get a check every month just for the percent of sales, they're, they're, the rent they're paying, that's not a good reason to do it. But I did not want to give up my sunglass business. I did not want to give it up because I thought, come on, this is a super high margin business. Why don't we just do, you know, to, to run this more professionally than we're doing? And we run it very professionally for about six months. And then we'd end up, you know, cutting the staff or something or not getting all the right inventory or something. And we'd just mess it up. And, you know, it, we were, it was fine. It was, it was good business. It was pro very profitable. And it, was, it was growing. But we did an experiment with Sunglass Hut. And we did the experiment in our Florida stores. And I got to tell you, if we can't, if they can run, <laughs> they can run sunglasses in Florida better than we can. They can run it anywhere. Okay, so sure enough, they killed us. I mean, they were so much more productive than our store. I mean, I'm talking like three times more productive. Wow. They loaded the store. They had loaded the space with uh, three people where we had one, you know, for three Maybe. quarters of the day, right? Maybe. <laughs> right. Maybe, yeah. Okay. Like for, for several hours, we had nobody. but somebody from handbags trying to sell sunglasses. You know, so I said, uncle, I uncle. Yeah, I give up. Gave it to Sunglass Hut. We tripled our business. We tripled a already profitable business, and we worked out an arrangement with them where we didn't give up margin. So we tripled our margin as well. That's there are examples like that where you should definitely give it up and let them run the business for you. I don't necessarily believe we should be a Harrods or a Selfridges and have everything leased, but I do believe there is somewhere between where American department stores are today and that model, that could be a very enticing and, add, and to your point, add new reasons for consumers to come into your store. I think it's also important where you find a lot of brands that were very focused D to C and maybe grew a bit wary of wholesale are now, again, focused on the importance of wholesale, having the product where the customer is. Often in my conversations with brands, I'm very curious to see how they're growing their wholesale, how they're picking a key partner to grow their wholesale with and make sure the product is in front of the customer in a way that they're proud of in as many locations as possible. So I think it does open up opportunities for department stores to grab brands, to showcase brands and do it in a way that they couldn't do, as we just discussed, and help that brand grow and help keep a department store distinctive. Totally agree. In my early days, which is your viewers will not relate to. I remember being upset with Ralph Lauren because he was opening freestanding stores next to my department stores where I had a big Ralph Lauren business. And I was, you know, upset about this. We're going to lose our business. This didn't happen. I mean, it did, it, our business got better in some ways. They would go and shop the Ralph Lauren store, which is pristine and beautiful and and then they'd come in and buy from us. So, so it actually worked out. I was very surprised at that. But, you, you know, the brands can, in fact, enhance their brand. And, and they're so passionate about it. They can do a better job. What you don't want to have happen, at least I didn't want to have happen, is I didn't want to look like a London department store, which is no offense. They did a great job and did a great business. To me, they kind of lost their personality because the shop in each one of those competing stores all looked the same. And so that you didn't know if you were in a Selfridges or a Prontomp or a, you know, Harrods, you know, the shops basically all looked the same because they were built, designed, created, implemented by the designers, by the brands. And, and I felt that the store lost its unique character, or I was afraid at least in the United States that we would lose our unique character if we didn't control that. So again, I think there's opportunity to learn from the brands who know their business better than anyone, but also to maintain your uniqueness in terms of your what you stand for inside of your store. I think Ralph also took a bit of a hybrid approach with you at the time. I remember, I think it might have been Roger Farah who gave you more payroll and put payroll into the stores, into the Ralph Lauren shops to really help with that customer experience. So maybe not doing a pure lease department, but still helping to operate it as if it were one of their stores. That's correct. It actually became a, a model. First of all, we have that, that is the model in beauty for us. And 
that, that we have a you know shared expense for our associates and for each of, of the brands that actually works. They're, it's quite productive space. And Roger and, and the Ralph Lauren team implemented that beauty model into apparel, which made a lot of sense. And then today, we have that model at all of our big stores. So downtown, you know, New York, downtown San Francisco, downtown Chicago, all the big markets have that, that model where we do some shared costs for associates, shared training for the associates in many parts of the store. From shared associates and trying to control labor costs to inventory costs. One thing that I've noticed the trend with department stores, and maybe this goes back five or so years, is the idea of doing drop ship. The idea of borrowing the vendor's inventory to show it on the website, but not necessarily own the inventory. And I think this is becoming a bigger and bigger trend, which allows department stores to carry less inventory show more selection, but ultimately, I think, puts a lot of pressure on the vendor who has to own the inventory and the risk. Is this a, a positive trend for department stores, one that you see continuing? How does this play out? I do. We call it marketplace. And, and I do think that it is a easy way and a cost-effective way for you to expand your business and expand your offering, your assortment, your product categories uh, to your customer base. What I worry about is the actual execution. Some will do it better than others, but I've had my, my own personal experience with retailers where I knew it was coming from a third party, but when it did, you know, the actual experience was not up to the standard of that retailer, in my opinion. And I always let the re retailers know, not because I want anything from them, but I want to let them know because I'd want to know. And so I think that's the worry, but I think the retailers are getting better and better at choosing partners. And when they do that, then they do that the right way. This is a very good way to expand your offering. It's hugely profitable. I mean, I wish they had one of those when I was a kid and I was a buyer where I could just say, I'm going to put your inventory up online. I'm not going to buy it, but when I need it, I'm going to take it from you. Oh, and then I'm going to pay you 30 or 60 days later. And I'm right. just trying to like think of what the reaction would have been by the vendor at the time. Wait, say, say that again. You I mean, you're <laughs> not going to send me a purchase order. You're going to want my best seller. And you're not going to pay me right away? And then today, the vendors are saying, okay, how many of the items would you like? I mean, yes. it's, it's, it's what they need to do to stay alive. That's right. It's tough. It's a tough bargain. It is a tough bargain. And here's the other thing. One of the major things that has changed with the online, uh, online access to products by consumers is price. You know, you used to have to walk down the mall to compare prices, you know, the Nordstrom or, or, or Dillard's, you know, to Macy's. And if it was $5 more at my store, they'd go buy it somewhere else. Understood. And we had our people going down and checking every day. They were going for other departments. They would go down to the mall and check to make sure they're, you know, they weren't, you know, uh, being undercut price-wise. Online, it, it happened while you're freaking on the site. Their dynamic pricing is going on. It's like, wait, wait, wait a minute. And so they know you're looking at Amazon, and so they're changing their price to match the Amazon price. And so, yeah, it's complicated. And I also think it makes it very hard for the brands to maintain integrity. I mean, brands as well as the store brands, as well as the product brands. It's hard to maintain integrity when the product's being bounced around. I do think that's one of the secrets to the luxury business and why they've been so successful. The price is the price is the price no matter where you go. And so you violate that price and it's all legal and it's all the right way, but they're not going to do business with you anymore. You know, just, that, that's just the way it is. They don't want their consumers to feel embarrassed because their neighbor got the Louis Vuitton bag for, you know, cheaper than they were able to pay for it. So that critically important maintenance of, of price has been a important piece of the effective strategy for the luxury brands. And I think that is less effective at the, the mid-tier and, and lower price brands. You touched on how technology has enabled us to really see real-time pricing. Staying with technology, what are you seeing from a tech perspective? What platforms are you seeing? Or how is technology now and going forward impacting 
retail? What are some of the big changes you're seeing or excited about? There's so much that I'm excited about. Tools that were nation, nation, and, and when I was there, but now are in progress or about to be. And, you know, I always felt like the biggest opportunity was the effective management of your inventory. Because, you know, the biggest hit to your margins is markdowns in the fashion world, right? And you want to sell out the last item at full price before it's time to mark it down. There are very few items left over. And when you're selling that product really well in Miami and can't give it away in Chicago, it's a problem because of the online, because you can see the price in one city and you can see it in the other city. And so it drives you crazy a little bit because you know you could sell all of those you know, at full price in, the, in one market if they were all there. And so I think the ability to understand that and to do something about it with your forecasting of your receipts is getting better and better and better. We had that technology to a degree. I just don't think it ever materialized into the big improvement in turnover and markdown rate reduction that I believed it should. And I think that's still improving. And I think that will, over time, become really important. I work with companies that do a number of things. One is a company called New Data Network that looks at all of their transaction data and is really good about telling you where that consumer is going next. Because they don't look just at the Macy's transactions. They look at what they're buying at Home Depot and at Kroger and everywhere else. And, and so they can see, oh, it looks like they're either about to move or they're going to renovate. And what can you do to put product in front of them that's relevant? Looks like they're going to have a new baby because based on what they're buying here, looks like they're going to expand their family. What opportunity do we have here to furnish a new bedroom for a baby and, and baby clothes to go along with this new expansion of their family? So they're really good at targeting this information and providing the retailer with this data. Another one, uh, they've been in a sports business, but so you're at Yankee Stadium and you're talking among chat. You know, all the fans are talking about chats. Did you just see uh, that our pitcher just threw a 98 mile an hour, you know, curveball? That's impossible. How did he do that? You know, and so, and they're going back and forth. Next thing you know, that pitcher's jersey pops up as an item to buy in the chat window. And now we're working on how do you move that to other conversations on online with apparel products, accessory products, footwear, and the like. I think the most important thing is all this comes back to one thing. Don't clutter the consumer with stuff that he or she doesn't need, isn't interested in, and won't buy. Be completely relevant. And I think if you are, then at least in my case, I don't mind seeing product that is learned information about my history of and my patterns of, of shopping. I don't mind seeing that. I just hate to see the, the irrelevant stuff. And, and so, and by the way, irrelevant can mean product, color, size, price. All those things need to be filtered and understood. And so I, I just think there's so much opportunity for us to improve all of these, these subject matters with, with technology. And I mean, I don't even know what's next with, the, with this generative AI. You know, I mean, it, every day it seems like we're learning something new, some new way to apply it to our business. I just think it's, I think it's very exciting. You know, one of the challenges you mentioned, inventory, I always think that that's a, probably one of the retailer's biggest challenges. Certainly it's one of the biggest costs that sit there is, your, is inventory. You mentioned being able to take inventory from underperforming stores. What happens to it when you know you can sell it in other stores? I think now part of the solve to that is how brands can do buy online and ship from store, how I can move inventory from underperforming stores directly to the customer. You and I are working with a company at this point, Drop It Shopping, and Drop It is really focused. It's a layer that sits on top of the order management system. I can discern, is it better to pick goods from the warehouse or from the store? And using AI, it'll make that determination. And it also does the same in reverse. Once I have this shirt and I'm sending, I don't need it because it doesn't, I don't want it, it doesn't fit. Do I send it back to the warehouse or does it go to the store in New York, which is closest, which, which needs the item? So I think a much better use of inventory that's out there. Number two, something that Macy's, I think, 
took the lead on in the department store space, RFID, radio frequency identification, which has been around for quite a long time. But there really is no better way to get an exacting idea of what inventory you have. Without RFID, if the numbers I'm using are correct, typically a retailer's inventory can be off 27 to 30% in terms of its inventory accuracy. Now, I don't know how you can serve up a customer a great experience when they buy online and go to pick up in store if retailers aren't sure of 25 to 30% of their inventory. So I think RFID will continue to play a very important role in that space because it gives you a better idea of what you need. And it also, I think, allows you to carry less inventory because you can rely on what you actually own if you have RFID. Yeah, that, well said. Let me comment on the, on the drop it. Uh, business model, because I do think that they are in a really good position to help manage inventory better than what most retailers are doing today. And everything you said is right on. And, and key to that, Ken, is that you're taking a lot of the costs out of delivery. Everything you just described is taking costs out of delivery. If you can deliver it local or better yet, if you can drive the consumer to pick it up locally, that's the best transaction. No cost. They put it in their car and drive away. And so I think Drop It is in a great position to help retailers accomplish this. On the RFID subject, it's true. You know, when it came to me and my team really led the charge for the National Retail Federation to get Walmart on board and get Target on board, because we knew that. The only way that we could make this work is if we could get critical mass and, and get broad support. Because it was, it was expensive at the time to insert the chips into the, the product and tax. And so we had to get broad appeal. And, and I was saying, well, wait a minute, what's going to come next? You know, because we haven't been in UPC for that long. <laughs> so what's next? If, if, are we sure that RFID is going to last? And here we are talking about it now, decades later, right? And I do think it is outstanding technology, and I think everybody has adopted it. And I think you can actually refine and improve RFID. So to me, I'd run with that as fast as, as, I, as I could and, and capture the data on a precise local level to help all of us get the inventory in the right place in a more effective way. Last question. I don't know if this is a tech question or just an issue at large, but one thing that seems to be plaguing all retailers right now is shrinkage, shortage, theft. What do we do? It's a big concern. It used to be that this was a bigger problem for department stores because we had four, five, seven doors, you know, three levels in a mall, parking lot, sides, forward. And so you could go to any one of those doors and and make your way out almost unnoticed and and I so I thought it was a big advantage for the the Walmarts and Targets and the off prices of the world uh, with and Coles with one single door you know that you could at least manage that isn't uh, enough to slow down this problem as we know because the specialty stores are being particularly hit hard on this theft subject the first thing I strongly believe is that that our local government can do more, that we can do more by making these crimes punishable by holding them accountable at a felony level. At this point, it's a slap on the wrist. If you steal under a thousand dollars, we're we're seeing people get arrested twice in the same day. You know, you get arrested, they let them go, they come back and they steal from the same store. I mean, so there's no penalty. There's no there's no risk here. Secondly, is a big problem that's happening in big cities now is when you have this mass group. You have 25 shoplifters in a store at the same time, and the stores basically are helpless. That has to be detected in advance. It can be. There has to be complete support of law enforcement. We have to completely support law enforcement and allow them to know when these groups are forming. And you can see it. The cameras are there, but the response time isn't in it. And it's because they're not incented. And I would figure out you know, that's what I would strongly encourage, particularly in the big cities, of how to incent our police departments to deter these events. I mean, that's the key. It's not to stop them. It's not to get away of 20 people that are running out of a, of a store and trying to tackle them. The, the answer is to deter this. And that's with 
higher penalties and complete support of the uh, law enforcement in all these cities to make sure that they are armed with the right tools, information, knowledge to know when these groups are forming. You know, I think uh, an, an add on to that, aside from the fact that it's costing the retailers money, it's creating safety issues in the stores for associates and, and also for the customers, but also just the problems that we're facing today with what's happening to the inventory. You know, some retailers are putting it behind glass or taking key items off the floor. So it makes it even less likely that I want to walk into a store just knowing I'm going to have to wait at Target for AirPods because I lose a pair every week, you know, 20 minutes while someone goes to get them from the stock room, sends them upstairs, you're looking at so many empty racks. So this is having a big knock-on effect, not to mention how many retailers who might not be on RFID, how long does it take them to realize that those items are actually out of stock? So the best sellers that a thief just walked out with was an item I was going to buy. So the opportunity cost and loss on those items is yet another problem. It's really quite a big problem, bigger bigger than just the maybe 15 or 20% lift that we've seen and shrink over the past few years, but it's having just a huge knock-on effect on the way we shop and I think on what's available to us as customers. I totally agree with you. And you know, you mentioned the Apple example, but many of these stores don't have the profitability and productivity that an Apple store has. So they can't afford to have six people on the sales floor in this one box. And, and they've got one person trying to you know, protect the inventory. And if it's all locked under glass, which is what you do, that's what you do. You put, it on, you put all the, the fashion jewelry, not just the fine jewelry, the fashion jewelry under glass, and your, your sales go down 50% because it's a pickup business. And you know people look at it, they see it on the counter, they touch it, they say, well, I'll take that. And if it's under glass, they're not going to do that. I mean, and, and then they say, hello, someone, can you unlock this case for me? Your sales are going to go down 50%, a dramatic drop. So there's opportunity costs here associated with this subject too. So big subject, big, big problem. I think solvable by some of the comments that I made, made earlier. I think we need to get tough on this subject. And when we do, we'll, we'll deter more people. All right, Terry, ready for rapid fire? Yes. Let's do it. If you didn't lead Macy's as the CEO, what company would you want to lead? You know, it wouldn't be a retailer, but I'm on the board of Procter & Gamble, and I love that business. I think that's what I would want to go. I would, that's what I would aspire to do is be the CEO of Procter & Gamble. They've got 70 brands or $85 billion business and uh, multiple countries, and it's very exciting. Favorite streamed show? So I'm watching, I'm right at the conclusion now, Drops of God, and it's not religious. It's about wine, and it's a fabulous, fabulous series. One of the best I've seen. And This so just I'm hit excited. my radar. I just heard about this like two nights ago at dinner. It's on Apple TV, right? It's on Apple TV, and I've heard it now. I heard it like two, three different people in like two days. And I said, oh, let's, let's watch this. And, you know, the first episode, wow, it's interesting and, you know, kind of hard to get through. And then I watched the second one and then I couldn't stop. And then I watched one, another one right away. And now I'm almost at that. I'm, I'm ready for my, I don't want it to end, but I think I'm on the last episode coming up. It's very, it's fabulous. I love it. Favorite place to vacation? You know, I'm here. I traveled in my career all over the world all of the time. And I was actually in Bermuda till yesterday, which is really nice and great. But I'm at my home on the west coast of Florida, an island called KC Key, and I can't describe it. It's paradise. And I don't get here enough. And every time I'm here, I say, God, I got to spend more time here because I'm on the road half the time. But I feel so relaxed here. This is when I want to go on vacation. I tell my wife, we're staying home. That's my vacation. What retail brand do you admire most? I'm going to go with. A big one and a small one. Uh, the big one I might surprise you, but I'm really impressed with what Walmart has done. I mean, this is a gigantic battleship trying to turn in a small harbor. And they have done amazing things. And I think Doug McMillan and his team have been so open-minded, so open-minded about trying new things and you know, very controversial things, buying these small brands. They built up an internet business that they did not have before to a substantial level now. I love that they tried to have their sales associates take products and drive them on their way home from work. And they paid them extra to do that and drop them off at consumers' house 
you know, you know how, how upset everybody was about that and all the reasons why this was a bad idea. I thought it was fabulous and it made so much sense. Employees are making more money. It was a personal connection with an employee's consumer. I mean, I thought it was fantastic. So uh, they're just doing a lot of interesting things. And then I think the small one is Viore. This is a fabulous apparel company, started as a yoga brand for men's and has expanded now into broader athletic apparel for men and women, doing fantastically well. The product is really different. I give them credit. They have unique product and unique fabrics. Fantastic brand. That's my pick. Good picks. Last question. If we were shopping together at a mall and we got separated, where would I find you? Macy's or Bloomingdale's or Blue Mercury. I'd be, because like, just, I can't help myself. If I'm walking by, I got to I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to go check it out. Can't help myself. And with that, Terry, we'll end this flight of the retail pilot. Thank you so much for joining me today. What a great conversation. Thanks, Ken. My pleasure. Enjoyed talking with you. Thanks for tuning in to this week's flight of the retail pilot. And please give us a review on your favorite podcast platform.